Well, I'm excited to get started. I will go ahead and uh, not waste any time. We'll go ahead and uh, play this intro music in and get things rolling. Let's do it. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff. All right. Welcome, everyone. You get the horn show. Tad and Jeff here. And I am excited. I'm more than excited. Jeff, I know you're excited. I'm sweating right now. Uh, yeah. We have. <laughs> I'm we clammy. Have, <laughs> we have a special uh, guest with us tonight. A guest that I am incredibly excited. We are incredibly excited to have the opportunity to speak with. Um, I'm not sure if this was part of a make a wish thing or something like that, <laughs> that she agreed to do this. Uh, uh but we're incredibly I said community appreciate. service. I'm pretty sure it's community <laughs> service. She did something wrong. Yeah. But yeah. we are incredibly appreciative, uh, to have the one and only Michelle Tafoya here, uh, with us on the show. So thank you so much, Michelle. Oh, welcome, gosh. welcome. Up. When they told me I could negate that traffic ticket with an appearance on this show, I <laughs> jumped at the chance <laughs> yes sir i'll do that yeah yeah you well, considered i'm sure you uh, considered paying the ticket it's yeah. my pleasure no i i love your invitation and i'm really happy to be here awesome. well this is super exciting for us uh you know one of the things we were talking about you know before we started was just we don't do a lot of interviews because our show is first of all oftentimes very dense we have a tendency to go very long but we talk about a lot of different topics and so we talk a lot of sports on the show, but we also talk, you know, politics and current events and things like that and kind of try to get, I don't know, below the surface of what you would typically see kind of in, I hate to use the phrasing mainstream media, but that's kind of, you know, in the parlance of our time, that's what yes, you talk about. Exactly. And so we try to go a little bit deeper and there are very few people that have the ability to speak in both of those lanes and have a, have a foot in both, in both worlds. Yeah. And you are one of the few and certainly one of the very best. Uh, to be able to do that. So oh, uh, you're putting the pressure on me now. <laughs> you have no idea what I might deliver today. So we just have to keep our fingers crossed. Well, you uh, have to understand the bar is low. The bar yeah, is low. So low. <laughs> <laughs> if you doze off halfway through this episode, we won't even be upset. It might not even be the first time it's happened. So. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so listen, I, I want to go through a couple things here, you know, for just uh, as kind of a proper introduction and I, I could spend the next half hour only talking about your credentials and, and, and background and everything else. Um, but most people probably over the last you know decade or so would probably know you from your role as sideline reporter for Sunday Night Football on NBC. Yeah. Um, but you've been all over the place. I mean, the Olympics and, you know, Monday Night Football and ESPN. I mean, it's just yeah. there's very little that you haven't done in sports over the course of your career, which is just awesome and um and you stepped away from that obviously uh, a little while back to pursue other interests mm -hmm. and so you know what i thought we would do is the first part of the show kind of wanted to learn a little bit about your your past in sports and of course we have some questions that we just think people would be interested in knowing and understanding in that role as sideline reporter and then you know we'll kind of transition into part two which is more what you're doing now the the political side and you know and that stuff Sounds and, good. Um, yeah, I think I it'll hope, be interesting. I hope, I hope we don't bore people. <laughs> Listen, the people will be fine. As long as you're not bored, everyone else, <laughs> they can deal with it. They can turn it off. Uh, but I wanted to ask this, you know, I, I think to kind of start, you ended up doing sideline reporting on the football side of things. Now, you've obviously done lots of other things involved in lots of other sports. Is there a particular sport? Like, did you end up doing football because football is just your favorite sport? It was something that you always migrated toward? Or did you just kind of find yourself in those opportunities and it made sense to pursue? No, uh, you know what? My goal was always to cover the NFL, always. And I took a lot of steps along the way to get there. I didn't know where those steps were necessarily going to take me, but I knew that that's what I wanted. The, the NFL is what made me fall in love with sports. I mean, I grew up playing sports and watching sports, but uh, my dad raised us 49er fans in Los Angeles, California. So we were kind of in the minority. Got and the uh, yeah, so <laughs> That's the interview. let's go. 
Good. So, uh, <laughs> you know, but, but about it was really not fun for many years. And then a couple guys named Bill Walsh and Joe Montana showed up. Yeah. And at that time, you know, I, I fell absolutely just in love with the NFL. And, um, and so, but I, even then I didn't know that that's what I was going to end up pursuing. Uh, but once I did decide on sports and sports broadcasting as the goal, um, I knew that I, I really, the NFL was where I wanted to be. It was what I wanted wow. to do. I loved it so much. I, you know, spent years educating myself in it. Uh, but gosh, darn, I'll, I'll tell you this, being able to cover the Olympic games five times as I did was just an absolute joy. And some of the things I got to, got to do, especially the Phelps years at the swimming pool, you know, it was just unbelievable. So, um, it, it, I'm really grateful for all the opportunities that I got that, that were outside of the NFL, but to answer your question, that was always the goal. That's awesome. I mean, That's and what, a awesome. yeah, well, you, when you found that opportunity, you certainly took advantage of it uh, fully because, you know, I can tell you that you are, I think, one of the very few, you know, folks that have really kind of really stood out as that sideline reporter, um, you know, that people, you know, people watching you are you are and were a very popular part of that process. You know, it's not just Al and Chris in the booth type of thing. You know, it was very much that you were part of that. Um, that package and and people are so familiar with you in that role um and i oh, go ahead i was just gonna say you know what i was really blessed because um the monday night crew was with madden and al michaels <laughs> and you know gee that was that really stunk it was so cool yeah, it was it was kind of surreal at times you know this is a guy i'd grown up watching and just um, and then also producer and director Fred Goodelli and Drew Esikoff. They may not be household names, but they should be. They're both in the Sportscasters Hall of Fame. Fred Goodelli, our, our producer, just went into the NFL Hall of Fame, um, which is so cool because they did so many innovative things that they were supportive, though, in of the silent reporting role in a way that I had never seen before. And so was Al Michaels and, and both John and Chris were as well. Um, but it was a different it was it was really nice that way that they really felt that that role was important. And some days you, you did very little and some days you had to do a ton of heavy lifting. So, you know, but, but you were there for those days for either you, you know, you were there. And if you, if you discovered the purpose of your being there and you did it well, um, there was, it was just, I was very lucky. Well, yeah, it's 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 crazy just to hear you even talk about these things, right? The names that you're throwing out there that you worked with yeah. are just the absolute legends, yeah. uh, you know, of the of the game. And yeah. so it was an in incredible <clears throat> kind of learning ground for you, I'm sure, you know, as you're as you're kind of going through that with, you know, with so many of those folks. I do know we would be interested if you would indulge us in doing a little bit of a deep dive into kind of that life of a sideline reporter. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on it, but we did have a few questions because I do think, you know, as fans, we have questions that we just think, you know, maybe it's logistical things, but we just want to have kind of an understanding yeah. of how it works. And Jeff, I know you had one that you were kind of yeah. wanting to kind well, of jump I, in with. I just think it's things that like NFL fans don't think about, right? So there's just so much stuff like travel. What's a travel day? <laughs> when do you arrive to the city? So you, you're done Sunday night. I mean, the game is over, I don't know, 1130, 1145, depending what you're getting out of the stadium one o'clock in the morning uh, not little... quite that late but it you okay. know we, we we tried to get out of there within 15 20 30 minutes of the game's well, ending okay. so it's still late so and, you're and booking it but yeah so, yeah booking it but um <laughs> they they took really good care of us that way uh but it's um yeah i mean game ends i'm done uh, you know, post-game interview, and then I go back to the trucks. It's a whole compound underneath that stadium, and maybe you guys have seen it. It yeah, is. Seen, yeah. Have you seen it? It's yeah, just, we, you know, just some stuff that they'll like. You know, always. I, I always think of like you know Thanksgiving and Christmas time when they're thanking all of yeah all of the video people. So you see yeah. just kind of the enormity of it. I don't think you've ever yeah seen it like live, like, Oh my gosh. Like you know. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's multiple trucks. Um, and, and I mean, so many people, 
you play pivotal roles to put this thing together. So once you're done on the field, you go back to those trucks and we sort of had this meeting area and then we get thrown into this sprinter van. Oh, I say thrown, but now Alan Chris, <laughs> Alan Chris would jump on their private planes and go home. <laughs> yeah. I wow. didn't have that luxury. <laughs> You know, it reminds me of right now running backs are <clears throat> in the NFL are thinking of having uh -huh. their own union because they yeah, think sure. they're not paid well mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of relate, but I'm kind of saying to them, dudes, don't even try it because <laughs> if you're worth it, you're going to get paid. Yes. But the role, every role on a football team is different. Every role on a broadcast team is different. And so whereas Alan, Chris have the private planes. <laughs> I did not. So I would go back to the hotel and I'd hang out with the little people and uh, Al and Chris know that I love them and I'm just teasing, <laughs> but I'd go back to the hotel. Sometimes Al would stay. And that was always such a treat when Al would stay the night and, and not go home till the following morning. Uh, but we'd go and we'd have a drink and we'd, you know, shoot the, you know what, and just yeah. kind of uh, talk it through and talk about all kinds of stuff. Then um, Monday morning, I'd get up and uh, fly home and I'd get home and I'd be dead. But you're not done. You during the football season, much like the players, you don't stop working right. I mean, on the flight home Monday. I'm breaking down what I have to do for the following week. And it's a lot of tedious crap, a lot <laughs> of detail work, stuff that I mean, there were times where I'd, I'd have to repeat to myself the old John Wooden saying, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. <laughs> failing to prepare is preparing to fail. As I did this tedious work that I did. Uh, but it had to be done, and it made you better prepared for the days that you were there. So then I'd get home, hang with the family Tuesday, be at home Wednesday, be at home. And Thursday morning, I'm packing up to leave that night. So, you know, you have a little less than half the week at home and a little more than half the week at the airport, in the airplane, and heading back out. Because by Friday, we were then at the facility. Let's say we're doing a Dallas Cowboys game. We get there Friday, we go to practice, and then we have meetings after practice with the head coach, the quarterback, and a smattering of other players. And then <clears throat> the next day, we meet with the visiting team once they come in from the airport. And then Sunday morning, we're up early having a meeting and getting ready for, the, for game day. So it used to make me laugh so hard when I'd run into people on the field <clears throat> and they'd say, oh, when'd you get in last night, this morning? And you're like, I've been here for days, <laughs> that man. That is you know? funny. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I just, just think it's yeah. things they don't know. Right. right. I, I, right. You just would never guess. Now, I I guess <laughs> like, yeah, I'm assuming they're going to have to get in early because, you know, you see these interviews are like the snippets that you get with these interviews. Yeah. So what's that like? What is like the you know, interview with the players, are they, yeah. and coaches, are they open or are they just there because they're obligated kind of a mix? <laughs> well, the nice thing is I think when you're working with a crew like ours and you've got Al and you've got Madden or Chris, um, and you've got people who have been doing this for decades and decades, relationships have been established. And that's one thing I worked extremely hard at was making sure that they could, they felt comfortable. They could trust me. They could say stuff off the record and I would never repeat it. Uh, all that kind of stuff. And we, you know, so, so most of these guys, they all knew us, you know, and I mean, the number of times we covered the Cowboys and the Patriots and the Bucks <laughs> and the Giants until they got bad for a while. <laughs> there were certain teams that, you know, you just were going to see Green yeah. Bay. You were going to see them multiple times every year. So they got to know us and, and these meetings turned out to be really enjoyable. I will say that after landing on Monday, um, back at home, I knew I was going to have marching orders to spend time on the phone with other players during the week. So before I even left for sight, I would get on the phone. I'd say, okay, I need to talk to, you know, this offensive lineman, this D back and this linebacker or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so you spent a lot of time I did on the phone during the week talked to maybe it was a defensive coordinator maybe it was a special teams coach maybe it was whoever i had my assignments that were mine alone during the week before i even got on the road so there was you know but uh, it, everyone was different the guys who were being asked a thousand times a week to do an interview you know and then there were the guys that were never asked and they would go i'll give you all the time you need what do you need you know? <laughs> just some really cool but for the most part i mean i would say 99% of the time our meetings our interviews were just fantastic they were um 
really great learning opportunities. And they allowed us to tell stories during the game that you wouldn't otherwise hear. Yeah, that's, that is really, yeah. You know, you don't think about it like that, right? That like you're, you're building relationships because you say like you did that job for, I mean, over a decade, just on Sunday night football, right. alone, not to mention, right. you know, the, you know, the other things. And so, yeah. you know, you, yeah, it's not like you're seeing these people for the first time. So over time, I'm sure you do build, you know, kind of some confidence there and, you know, and that type of thing, which Absolutely. I think goes a long way. Yep. You had to. When you're on the, when you're on game day. Yeah. As the sideline reporter. And now you're having to to ask those those questions, get those interviews, those types of things. Is that extremely challenging? Because I would think during a game, no one, even though it's Michelle Tafoya, no one's that interested in like players or coaches having to have those conversations. And I'll right. be the first to say, I've I've always said this, even in, in our private, you know, kind of text chain with our friends. That the that the unfortunate role of having to grab the coach <laughs> on his way to the locker room and and like why they do that, I do not understand because yeah. you're not going to get anything. I don't think it has ever happened that anyone has been able to get anything out of a coach that is at all interesting, right? It's always just like defense needs to play better. Well, uh, we need to tighten up our, you know, so what do you think about this? I, I will say this. There are two ways you can do it. You can do the, the interview on camera, which I rarely did. I mean, my producer and I decided we thought the best stuff we could get is if we didn't have a camera and a mic in their face. Yeah. I'll go talk to them. I'll walk with them, whether they're walking off the field or coming back on. And we had our rules about which coach did which. Um, but it was better because they they might even throw in a swear word they, they would show their emotions they didn't snap to it for the camera they mm -hmm. just they would say stuff and then it was my job to condense it down into something i could deliver on camera after you know halftime kickoff second half let's go to michelle and now i've got to condense this into a cogent report of stuff that matters now did they all give me stuff that matters no um <laughs> Did they always give me stuff that matters? No. But at the same time, I can say that even in the NBA, there were times where I got gold at halftime, uh, either because, you know, J Greg Popovich was ticked or even in the <laughs> NFL, you know, uh, Tom Coughlin was all of a sudden he was just so mad at a player that he'd go off. And um, so th there were times where it was really valuable. And of course, Yes, you're the last person they want to see. And that's such a joy to know that you're walking up to a guy that's like, I, you're the last person I want to see right now. But they were all really great about it. They were great about it. Yeah, that's really cool. That's interesting because, yeah, I would have thought, and of course, yeah, you mentioned the NBA stuff. And obviously you did stuff with the Minnesota Timberwolves and, you know, and, and like the, the NBA side of things, I think would, would, that is such a different dynamic, you know? So I'm, I'm sure that is a lot different when you're, when you're, and and you're exposed to such a different uh, group of players and coaches that, you know, I'm sure when you've done the NFL thing for so long, you kind of know the players and know the coaches and obviously some new ones come through from time to time. But, you know, then when you're able to do other sports, I'm sure that kind of keeps it interesting for you as well. It, it did. It certainly did. And I, I was doing the NBA before I got the Monday night football job. And I mean, I was doing some ESPN uh, Monday night countdown stuff and all kinds of different things. But I was doing the NBA on ABC, and that's how I met Al Michaels, and that's kind of how I got the job on Monday Night Football. So um, Al Michaels and I worked together. Our first game, he tells me, because I can't remember, but it was a Christmas Day game, and um, we just hit it off like gangbusters, and just it, it was so easy, and, and there was a mutual respect, which I was so fortunate to have from him. But that, that was the, big, the first domino that fell. Uh, but wow. I so I covered the NBA for for quite a while, like you said, with the Timberwolves, and I got to know some of the teams that way. And then uh, on ESPN, the NBA, and um, so I was fortunate enough to cover the finals. And my last finals were when the Celtics won, and Kevin Garnett said huh. to me, "Anything's possible." <laughs> Yeah. It was yeah, the it was most just, awkward thing. Uh, it I was loved awkward, it, but, but it was awesome. But it was <laughs> I mean, so you're now awesome. in every clip was, forever, right? I mean, I that's guess. like that's gonna live so on forever. Yeah, it was it was great. I, I'd known Kevin. I met him the day he graduated high school. I went to South Carolina to do a piece on him. And so he and I knew each other from that very tender age of so 
it was very cool. I had followed him all through his Timberwolves career, and then he gets to the Celtics, and so, here I am, the sideline reporter, getting to do the post game. And, I, and a little told, little told story is that because of my relationship with KG. Um, they let me in the locker room after the championship game and I was the only reporter they let in there. And I was just, I got oh, doused with beer and champagne gosh. and they, they had plastic <laughs> tape all over the locker room. But Kevin and I just embraced for this period of time because he knew that I had seen him through a lot of growing up, including when he first fell in love and, you know, how do I tell her I like her and all the, you know, all this stuff. So there was a lot of history there, but, um, Anyway, so yeah, that was, and that was when I walked out of there that night, I knew that was my last game. I hadn't told anyone else yet, but I knew that uh -huh. was my last game. I had a two-year-old waiting at home and I didn't want to miss any more. Yeah, my goodness. That, that well, you went out on a high cool. note, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah, that my is goodness. so awesome. Yeah, uh, that's just, that's, that's so great. Yeah. Um, one other question, I think just before uh, maybe we hop off the, the NFL. So injuries player gets injured and they go off the field mm -hmm. so it's always you letting us know he's being evaluated for a concussion or he's out where, where do you get that information from are you running to the doctors the trainers is someone else doing that like where how do you guys get your information um, like that for the vast majority of my career i was just running solo and you'd, you'd have to years and years ago like when i was covering college football you could talk to the trainer then you couldn't, and it was a hard stop <laughs> on that practice. Okay, yeah. So I think the trainers got a little bit too comfortable, and they just said, you know what? you got to go through the PR people from now on. So for the majority of the time I covered the NFL, you would go to public relations, and every team was different. I mean, sometimes you'd see a guy, just, you know, his leg was like broken in half, and they'd say, it's a lower body injury. And you're lower like, yes, body. I know yeah. that, but, you know. <laughs> so a lot of it was – First goal, observe, observe, observe as much as you can. Everything from which side is it on to what are the trainers trying to do to what does the guy look like? Is he in pain? You know, what's going on? The whole observation process is absolutely essential. And then you're following that player. And you, I mean, it it becomes you become like the biggest annoyance to the PR staff. But again, that's why they're there, too. So yeah. and then uh, ultimately you get an official word from them. But there became some guidelines, especially with concussions. Once you saw a player go to the locker room with a guy wearing a red hat, that was the neurotrauma consultant. And you knew once that player is leaving the field with the red hat, now they're in the concussion protocol. And you could go ahead and say that without PR telling you that you knew that that was a signal. So you had to be, you, you were watchful for that. Um, one of the brilliant things that Sunday night football did in the last few years of my time there was we hired a guy named Mike Ryan, who used to be the athlete, head athletic trainer for the New York Giants and then the Jacksonville Jaguars. And then he went off to practice on his own. Well, he came on board with us. And so he was a second pair of eyes on the field. So I would let's say I was on the Giants sideline and he was on the Cowboys sideline. <laughs> um, and we had this means of communication. He could tell me, you know, it's a you know right knee or whatever. Remember earlier I told you about that tedious work that I used to do? I went through every player on every team from practice squad all the way up to the Tom Brady's. And, and I had their injury history from, from as far back as I could go, but that was a weekly uh, update. The injuries update the injuries from, you know, for, I mean, we even had college injuries. We had, sometimes we had high school injuries in there. Oh. And so we've populated these charts. And so Mike Ryan, this head athletic trainer uh, became an integral part of helping us. And so that way, too, I could stay on the field. He'd run down the tunnel and find out what did the guy go in the x-ray room? Did he go? Which room no. did he go into? What's going on? And so he became a, a really valuable asset and a good friend. So um, th there's just there's a lot of detail that goes into Sunday Night Football. Well, yeah, and it's it's interesting because, you know, hearing you talk about it, 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 it kind of makes me realize that your time isn't just when, you know, they throw to you for oh, no. whatever it is. You're patrolling and prowling around the whole time. You're looking for information. You're gathering clues. You're keeping up to date on everything. So really, it's kind of like when they go to that that sideline reporter, 
that may be the time that everyone sees the work. Correct. But really, that's not even when the real work's being done. It's everything that's happening prior that just allows you to have that moment to, to actually deliver that information. Exactly. Very well put. You're kind of like the kicker. And that's and huh. that's why I, I say to these <laughs> to the running back union, I love you guys. But you can sit there and say, we work as hard as everybody else. We should get paid the same as everybody else. <sighs> I worked as hard as Alan, Chris, and everybody else. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Yes. I worked my tail off. And, you know, but the sideline reporter is a different animal. And there were a thousand people in line to take my job. Yeah. Uh, there aren't a thousand Al Michaels. There aren't a thousand Chris Collinsworth. So, you know, it, it's the market. It's the market. And that makes sense. And I think, you know, we can probably, I guess, officially break that news here on our show that Michelle Tafoya says NFL running backs are the sideline reporters. No, don't do that. <laughs> Football. <laughs> don't do that. I, 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 I agree that running backs put their bodies through it, but so so do offensive linemen, so do safeties, yeah. so, do, so do receivers. So I just think that their idea of a union is a little, maybe a little misguided. Well, so this is such an interesting topic. We could spend so much time on this I because know, we know. have we, we so have spoken yeah. about this yeah. so much on our show about yeah. running backs and their value and yeah. you know and 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 the timing of of the, the length of contracts and you know yeah. injuries and just all of these things and it is such a fascinating issue because it is so market driven, just like you said. Yeah, I mean, and, and, it and, is, and they are. There is a line of running backs. You know, yep. there just aren't many people that can play quarterback. Right. But there's a lot of people that that are are waiting in the wings to be able to play running back. And guess what? The guys who do it exceptionally well, the Derrick Henrys of the world, they get paid a lot of money. That's right. <laughs> they get paid a lot of money. Yeah. But again, it's less of a run game. You know, the pro game is about passing the football. And yes, you do need a run game. You need that balance. I get I get everything that they're saying. But I've thought a lot about this, and I just, um, I, I just think the the, the mar if you're worth it, the market's going to tell you you're worth it. Hard to argue. Hard to argue with that. Um, okay, so so this is going to take me into, uh, I guess, one other question that I have, and of course, obviously, we've got a million questions in general, but I've always been curious when you are doing that job, any of these jobs, honestly, you've had so many different things. Do you become more of a sports fan because you're doing them or less of a sports fan because you're doing it every day? And then when you step away from it, finally, do you then find yourself being more of a sports fan because you can actually operate as a fan versus, you know, the mechanic who's working on his own car? Right. So it's what is that like for you? It's so amazing that you're asking me that question today. Because just in the last week, I've thought, God, I kind of, I think I want to spend a little more time watching games because I haven't been for a while here because I've been like enough. <laughs> um, and I a think purge. it depends on where you are in the arc of your story. You know, as I, as I was climbing the ladder and working my tail off in radio and everything that followed, I just immersed myself, immersed myself. It was 24-7. Um, and then even when, you know, I would say once I got to Sunday night football as well on Monday night, I was so over the moon that I had that opportunity that I said, there's no way I'm screwing this up. So it was a 24 seven thing. Then you get to a certain point in your career where you're like, gosh, there's a whole lot going on in the world, <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't paying close enough attention to, and maybe I should do that now. <laughs> And, um, so then, yeah, then once I, the season would end, I'd start diving into other things. And, but once the season started, I'd get excited again. And, uh, I, I think once I left after that Super Bowl in LA, um, I kind of just like, I, it's almost like hitting a delete or control alt delete. I sort of reset and it's been that way for over a year now. Uh, but my, you know what, my husband, my kids are so into it. I, I and they, they all play sports. So I, I, I find myself getting sucked back in a little bit um, <laughs> so that I remain part of the family. <laughs> so, um, but it's a great question. And I really think it, it kind of just depends on where you are in the whole arc of, of the, of the career. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because, you know, it was one of those things when I thought through it, it was like, man, I don't know, like from the outside looking in, it seems like, oh, it'd be such a great job and you're in the mm-hmm. middle of it and you'd love everything. Yeah. But also like any job at a certain point, you kind of get tired of it and maybe you just get burned out from it and, you know, and those types of things. Um, and, and so I just wasn't sure kind of in general, can you, can you maintain being a fan when you are working in that industry or, you know, or does it just kind of hurt a little bit of that for you? But yeah, I guess you're I right. It is different it's, for everyone. It's different at, at different times, but it's a, it's a great question. Well, good, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I spent all of my time coming up with that one. So I got nothing <laughs> yeah. after this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 so one thing I'd like to clarify, because we're going to get ready now to transition over into kind of current uh, things that you're working on and, and that type of stuff. But one question I wanted to kind of just clarify, if you could. When you chose to leave Sunday Night Football, uh-huh. and, and, and again, if you don't want to answer this question, that's completely fine. You can you feel want. free to say so. But was it a situation where were you at the end of your contract was it a was it your decision to say hey you know what i'm hanging up my spurs and i, I want to move on or was it kind of a end of the contract and you weren't sure if they were going to be bringing you back or just you know how does that how does that end for you or not maybe not only necessarily for you but in general for someone in that role how do they Elizabeth, maybe find out that they're not in that role no you know what uh this was completely 1000 percent my decision and in fact i'll tell you exactly what happened 2018 season ends. I, Fred Gadelli, the producer, flies out to, to my hometown to visit with me. We have lunch. And I said, Fred, next year is going to be my final season. I want to do other things. So 2019 mm-hmm. is going to be it for me. And at that time, we had the Super Bowl on NBC for t- after the 2020 season. Oh. Stay with me here. He's like, Oh my God, I was not expecting you to say that. And I said, yeah, I just, I want to do other things and I don't want it to get too late to make that lane change, you know? Okay. So, you know, 2019 is going to be my last season. He calls me a little while later, months, a couple of months later. And he says, what if you just did half of the season in 2020 so you could stay on and do the Super Bowl? I want you to stay on for that Super Bowl. Oh, can, yeah, maybe I could do that. Okay, I could do that. So I'm going to do 2019. I'm going to do half of 2020. Well, then I find, <laughs> I find out at a dinner, at an NFL dinner with everyone's around the table. I'm, yeah, we're moving our Super Bowl to, to, after the 2021 season because of the Olympics are going to be a conflict and all this stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> Uh, huh? I had a plan I, here. I, I looked at Fred and I'm like, and he goes, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. I was going to tell you. And I'm like, I was going to tell you what? famous last words. <laughs> okay. So then he says, yeah, we're moving the Super Bowl to, you know, we're going to have it after the 2021 season. Cause it's going to be in LA and the stadium won't be ready till then. All these various things. Okay. So now we're on this, another extension. Okay. Into the 2020 <laughs> season. So 20, I do 2019, 2020 comes along and I'm going to do half the season and we're trying to decide which games I'll do. And then COVID hits. So I call Fred and I said, Fred, this COVID thing. And he's sitting there. He thinks I'm going to tell him I'm just done. Count me out. But what I said was, this is too complicated. Just count me in for the whole season. Just count me in for 2020. I'll do the whole thing. I might as well, you know, let's not make this any tougher. And he's like, oh my God, thank you. you." So, (laughs) so now I'm going to do 2020, right? And I'm going to do, and he says, then you could do half of 2021. Okay. That sounds good. So we finished 2020, the COVID season. That's a whole nother story. We start, we're getting ready for 2021. And he says, okay, you can do half the season. And I I finally said, you know what, Fred, it's my last season. Let me just do the whole thing. Let me just do the whole thing. And he goes, okay, but how would you like to have five games off? And I said, great. That sounds awesome. So, or four, maybe it was four. So I said, I, here's the thing. They're all going to be cold weather games. I hate cold weather games. So I said, I'm, I'm only taking off cold weather games. I will do every Dallas game. Even if it's on Christmas day, I'm doing a Dallas game. If it's indoors, I'm doing it. I said, I don't <laughs> want the green Bay in December games. So we look at the schedule comes out. We look at it. And we we find that a couple of the games are back to back. That's fine. He told me whatever I wanted. So we picked the games I wasn't going to do. Then I go on the view 
And I say some things they think are controversial about Colin Kaepernick and all the rest. And it just coincided with the games I was taking that off. Is this so is the funny. honest to God's truth. Okay. You can ask anybody, Fred, ask him. And so then they don't see me on Sunday night football after I do the view. <laughs> so I get this text of all people. I get a text from Lisa Salters, the sideline reporter on Monday night football. Yeah. She goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm just taking off a couple games to get me through the season. I'm preserving myself. You know, it's cold. So all these rumors start wow. that I've been booted. And, you know, NBC puts out a press release. No, that's not the case. No, da, 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 da. And I wanted to, I didn't want to go through my final season saying it's the farewell tour for Michelle. So I didn't say anything about my plan to leave. And then it got leaked, and then it was just all hell broke loose toward the end of the season. All hell broke loose. And it was so disappointing because I just really wanted to go out in a classy way that upheld yeah. my integrity and in a way that was of my choosing, yeah. which was completely what had <laughs> been planned to be. Right. But the for gods years. Were, for years. <laughs> right. So, but everything worked against me in those last few months and or couple months. And so it was just, it was disappointing but believe me when i tell you it was my choice i wanted to leave on my terms i wanted to leave before i was going to get booted out because of my age or anything else this was my choice and nbc was great about working with me through it all and so and the extra opportunities to do that super bowl in la and to do the COVID olympics were phenomenal so i'm just grateful Wow. That is, that is, uh, yeah, very cool. Uh, and, and I mean, yeah, it's crazy that the timing worked out the way that it did, it I guess. Nuts. With <laughs> It was nuts. We didn't have the foresight to plan that out better, right? but uh, it's crazy. Wow. Uh, okay. So Jeff, did you have something else before we kind of started to transition? No, no. If Are you I guys remember transitioning? Correctly. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Well, let me so, tell you well, 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 <laughs> that's leading right into my next question. Oh, here we go. <laughs> no, I am so, not transitioning, and I never have. <laughs> no, so, so here, here's what's interesting. And so, at this point, we'll kind of, uh, I guess, if you want to consider it uh, part two of the Michelle Tafoya experience here, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and moving into kind of the 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 post. NFL post sports side of things. Yeah. You know, you transitioned, you know, more into the politics, yep. uh, you know, side of things and speaking out about things that you feel strongly about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I was going to start off with was something that I, uh, that I know you were engaged with, uh, recently, uh, but it has been a story for quite a while now. And this has to do with Leah Thomas, mm -hmm. the, the swimmer and, you know, and, and, and the, the whole topic of transitioning and, you know, the, the, the process of, of that and, you know, the, I guess the sides that have been taken around those topics and, and the feelings that go into this. And, you know, look, we're pretty clear on our show in terms of what we feel. We look at ourselves not as conservative or liberal or Democrat or Republican. We just try to apply common sense to situations. And so it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. We look at it and we go, does that make sense or not? Right. And in my mind's eye, if someone biologically was a male for however many years leading up to this point, regardless of what they consider themselves now, when we apply it to sports, there is a natural biological advantage that comes into play. And I don't understand, and I was curious to talk with you about it, because as someone who has worked in sports, not necessarily that you had to deal with this topic so much, but I feel like the people that take these strong opinions and, and, and want to pretend that that doesn't exist either aren't being realistic about sports or are placing this idea of, uh, I don't know if you want to consider fairness or justice or something like that above reality when it comes to sports and competition. I'd love for you to be, to tell me that I'm wrong. I don't think you will. I think we're probably similarly minded on this, but I'm curious what your, you know, what your take is if you want to discuss it. I'll tell you that years ago, I had heard about um, young boys trying out for girls' soccer at a high school. Years ago, prior to all of this. Yeah. And my, my antenna went up, and particularly when a, a young boy or two made the team. 
meaning that some girls who were right there close to making the roster didn't because this person took their space. And I started to think about my own daughter who is now 14 and a soccer player. And I thought if that happened and it meant my daughter wasn't going to have the opportunity to play high school soccer because a boy took her spot. I, I mean, I can feel it right now. My <laughs> blood would boil yeah. because it's not fair. It's not right. It's not because I have any feelings toward that boy. If anything, I would have feelings toward the coach or the administration or whoever, whatever dope thought this was a good idea. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And so the NCAA blew it with Leah Thomas because they were scared. And you know why they were scared? Because this is the other prong of this whole this whole topic. You get called names if you go against that ideological grain. You get called transphobe, homophobe, white supremacist, bigot, all the ugliest names that nobody wants to be called. And if you're tough enough. And you can make that decision to be tough enough, by the way. Uh, it takes practice and it takes time, but you can be if you are tough enough. And if you're in a position of leadership, you damn well better be tough enough to say, they, sticks and stones, call me names. I'm going to do what's right. Yeah. But they didn't do what was right in the, in the place of Leah Thomas. And it is not right. And you are, you're absolutely correct in this. You are born with certain chromosomes. And if you are born a male, you're not assigned a gender you were born biologically scientifically a male or a female and it's interesting you don't see many female transitioning into you know uh, trans men right. and trying out for the nba or the right. men's swim team or yeah. whatever i think there's a reason and i think we all know it's pretty obvious so uh yeah this is a question of fairness this is a question of something that women fought for for years to be able to have their own sports division so that they too could make money and have opportunities and win and be on a podium and be on a team and just compete. And to come in here and say, well, Leah, yeah, come on in and come on, jump into the pool and go take that trophy. Uh, it's, it's insanity. And I don't know how we got here, but we got to get out of here. Well, I don't think I could have said it any better. I would have probably, I think I have said it worse. Uh, but uh, I mean, I, I mean, Jeff, what do you think? I, obviously, we've talked about this quite a bit on the on the show. And I think, you know, Michelle just kind of summarized yeah. a lot of our feelings as well. Yeah, no, I think it's it's a common sense approach, right? And so I, I guess this is um, a question I have for you, because I, I when, you know, you, you uh, graciously agreed to be on the show whether for community service or whatever it may have been, we'll leave that to, we'll leave that to other people to figure out. There you go. But I, I you know, I was just reading like some articles and, and just things that people had, to, like we have this image of Michelle Tafoya as being this sideline reporter and just kind of going along with everything. And then all of a sudden it's like, we hit the brakes, like, Whoa, she's got an opinion. And a lot of people did not like that opinion. I read I many articles that were, was just essentially like, yeah, like you said, essentially just trashing you and, and yeah. saying, and now since you're, you're a white supremacist or you're a racist, you're bigot, you're whatever. I, I just like, how do you, how did you handle that? Like, how, like, it just seems like you just don't care. And I absolutely love it. Like you are just so confident and, and yourself, and I'm sure it probably gets to you on certain days, but you know, and I'm, I know you have a ton of support. I, I see your stuff on, on um, I, I don't, what do we call it now? X? I, I, we, X. I can't figure that out. X. We're posting Is that what on we have X. to call it? Right. I okay. don't know. You can so, call it formerly known as Twitter. It's kind of like when yeah. Prince, you remember when Prince formally had that known. symbol? Yeah. He was just, <laughs> the artist formerly artist known. Formerly known. known. Yeah. No. So when, when you're posting on X, you, you get a ton of support, but then you just see some stuff in there and, and that's with anything that you post. But like, how do you, yeah. I, 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 I guess, how do you deal with it? Or, or is it just, you just don't care? It depends on whom it is coming from, right? If it's coming from someone I respect, it's probably going to sting a little bit. But then again, I would question why I respect them if they're, if they're way off base. Yep. If someone calls me out on something and I think about it and I think, you know, they have a point there, 
I, I'll say touche or I'll say, you know what? I didn't think about it that way. I, I'm very comfortable. I've made so many mistakes in my life that I've grown comfortable with it, that, you know what? It's okay. I'm still alive. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm human. But I feel so strongly. And this is what in 2018 was gnawing at me, which is why I said I'm leaving Sunday Night Football, because I knew I couldn't say all these things and be on the number one show on television. I would be a, an enormous distraction. And I accepted that. I said, you're right. We're, we're going to I'm going to respect this show and everything about it. But damn it, I do have opinions. And, you know, I. I love how they call me a white supremacist when I'm actually Hispanic, but that doesn't seem to matter anymore. I think no, anyone thought that. It doesn't, it doesn't did matter. They say, did they say, guys, on The View that Hispanics and blacks can be white supremacists? Right. I think they said yeah. that on The View. So I guess, you know, yeah. count me in. Yeah. Um, it, it, if it's just pundits and people who are kind of whatever, I, 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 have, I have grown a very thick skin. But there's an old Stoic saying uh, from Marcus Aurelius, it, it, if, you can, if you think you've been harmed, then you have. But if you don't think you've been harmed, then you haven't. And try it sometime because it's really true. It, so I, I just, I consider it part of the deal, part of what I signed up for. Freedom of speech is too damn important in this country. Um, I'm, I'll be damned if anyone's going to cower me into the corner or make me apologize for something that I'm, I don't feel bad about. There so they go. can call me names and they can try to say whatever they want to say about me. I know who I am and I, and I know what I believe is pretty even keeled. I'm, I'm not out there on either end. You know, no. I, I may be to the left or to the right on certain topics, but I'm certainly not at the margins. So um, I, I just, I've gotten to the point where I don't read the comments and there's no need to, they're, they're not going to help me. And why are they, they're not going to help me. <laughs> well, awesome. I, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And, and honestly, for anyone listening, I mean, what a great attitude to have because there's somewhere along the line and, and we've talked about it on the show and I don't know exactly when it happened, but the idea of having an opinion <laughs> became a bad thing, right? Yeah. That it was just kind of like everyone should kind of feel the same way. And even the idea, and we talked about this a while back, that like, when did it become so bad to be offended by something, right? Like, like why can't you just say, oh, that's not for me. I don't like that music. I don't like that comedian. I don't like that type of thing. And it's like, okay, it doesn't, why is it offensive if it's just not for you? Because and if you got offended, that's okay. Because now being offended is profitable in some way, shape, or form. We are participating in the Grievance Olympics, the Victimhood Olympics. I'm offended that you would call me a brunette. I'm offended that you noticed that I color my hair. I am offended and someone's got to pay. And, you know, and, and it, it's, it's a whole lot easier, right, to just, you know, oh, be just cower in the corner and be mad at everyone else than having to take responsibility for your own damn space in the world and your opinions and 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 be accountable for that. Instead, it's just so easy to sit back and let everybody else hurt you. And I I don't know how we got this way, but I, I'm certainly not gonna allow my kids to have that kind of attitude and, and I'm not and I'm not gonna have that kind of attitude. I'm just not. Uh, being offended fantastic. is a choice being yes. offended is a choice if you are offended by something i'm saying i that's your decision yeah. you yeah. don't have to listen to me you don't have to listen no it's so perfectly said and and we've talked about it so much that it's kind of like the idea of being offended by something and I, you you mentioned this recently uh, on your podcast. Of course, obviously, we want to make sure everyone's checking out the Michelle Tafoya podcast. But wherever you find your podcast, that's right. It is literally <laughs> on every platform. If you care about podcasts at all, you're already listening to the Michelle Tafoya podcast. But if you're download not, download and dummy, subscribe. Download and subscribe. Download and subscribe. <laughs> but seriously, you, you did an episode recently that I thought was so relevant to this because you know you were talking about uh, Queen. The rock group Queen, yeah, and and their you know which is one of their biggest hits, Fat Bottom Girls, and yeah. being left off of a greatest hits album because 
they're worried about young people being offended by this, which would <laughs> literally be the least possible offensive thing that could happen to a young person in yeah. any day of their life, including Sundays when they're at church. Like there's nothing less offensive than that song that's going to happen to a kid or an adult any day of their life. And this idea that we're picking and choosing the things, I don't know who the people are that are making the choices, but whoever it is, is picking and choosing what is offensive, what could be possibly offensive it's just insane. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting that you were, you know, talking about that topic. And because it's that's the exact type of thing that we talk about on the show quite often. I this mean, you don't, ha you don't have everyone. to listen to that Queen song. Right. You don't even have to listen to Queen if you don't want. <laughs> you don't even have to pay attention. Yeah. It's it's up to you. Go listen to what you want to listen to. Uh, but to say, I come, I demand that this be taken off. Now, here's where someone's going to yell back at me and they're going to say, well, what about the books being taken off the shelves in kids' libraries at public schools? Well, you know what? There's a difference between giving children access to pornography um, without anybody being there to, to steer them clear. That's a different thing altogether. So, And by the way, if you're the parent of that child and you would like to show your kid pornography, do it at home. I, right, right. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'm going to think you're weird, but I'm not going right. to tell you. But that shouldn't ma matter to you because right. that's because right. you're the one doing it. So if you want to do that, you knock yourself out. But to put it in a public school where small children have access to this kind of stuff is um, is a different matter altogether. So you know, I love these people that say the book has been banned. Uh, I saw it on Amazon, so <laughs> you can have it. Yeah, it's you not can, like prohibition. You can go find it. This is <laughs> yeah. not you know, piling up books in the middle of the, the town right. square and burning them all. This is, it's absurd. So um, I was, I was at Harvard recently. We were a, on a family trip to Boston. I went into this, the, the bookstore and they had this table and I had to take a picture of it because it, there was a sign that said banned books here at this table. Like here's the selection of banned books that the you can buy. You, can't you can't buy these, but they're right else. here. <laughs> And I thought, you know, sellers. I, I thought the people at Harvard were so smart, but I, right. it was hilarious. So wow. anyway, you know, understand what you're saying and don't just throw around the terms that the politicians and the social warriors want to throw around. Think about it. Do some second level thinking. Always. That's what, like, it, 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 you know, no matter what side you're on, like just yeah. take the time and actually do you know, we're, we're big into crypto and, and everyone on, uh, you know, on X is always D-Y-O-R, do your own research. And, and it's, it just applies to to all this stuff, too. Like it does. You know, I don't think everything that a Republican says is, you know, gold and, and the same nope. with like a Democrat. Right. It's just nope. common sense. You know, it, it's yeah, I, I just yeah. but I just think it's great because, it, you know, you saying this, you know, as far as, you know, I know who I am. I, I I have rights to do this. So many people are afraid to do that. And that's, <sighs> that's what happens. They just get smothered out of the conversation because they're afraid to have an opinion. It's like, no, it's fine. Have your yeah. opinion. Yeah. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter, but we just need more people on both sides. Yes. You know, we, we love to say both sides because, you know, there is <laughs> this whole left and right and we have to pick a side. And I'm like, no, I'm not picking any sides. I don't care. I don't want to be on anyone's side. I want to be on the right side. I want to be on the yeah. side that's right. And the common sense side, there has yes. to be people on both sides. You know, I can't imagine everyone on the left like agrees with stuff that's going on the same with I, everyone. I can't, on the right. I can't either. And and if you if if they then just stick to it because the party is more important to them than common sense, and that's a real tragedy. But yes. I'm with you on the you know, I, I talk about 2018 as being the year that I decided that I was going to make a change and it didn't happen for five more years. But anyway, um, <laughs> the, the, during COVID, I remember posting an article that I read and I found it, I think it was in Newsweek and it was about a particular medication and it was written by a doctor. So I posted the article and I said, you know, this is really an interesting take. That's what I said about the article. I didn't write the article. I just said, this is an interesting take. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was as though I was, I had come out in favor of, you know, like 
I, it, I don't even want to make yeah. analogies because don't it, you it, care no. about the children, Michelle? Oh, How could you? <laughs> <laughs> it was insane. And then I yeah. went further and I said, "Well, hold on a minute. Do uh, do we have freedom of speech or don't we?" Then I got attacked for uh, respectfully, Michelle. Freedom of speech really only has to do if the government becomes involved, and you know, oh, don't you love that? Yeah. That whole 2020 was such a cluster, you know, and, but I saw people and I talked to people who were afraid to speak. And I thought, this is not supposed to be happening in America. This is scary. We've got to put the brakes on. No, uh, you're exactly right. Because it it is such a problem and, and people are scared and, and you see people, I mean, they're, they're, let's face it in many cases they're scared for valid reasons because you do see people losing their jobs and Mm -hmm. and you know and and really being you know for lack of a better term destroyed over you know over a take that they have or a tweet that they sent six years ago or you know any of these things and you know in my opinion so many things changed and we've talked about a little bit on the show before but with the advent of social media yes because suddenly you know, previously it was like, if you thought something, if you had an opinion, you just had it, right? If you don't <laughs> like turkey on your sandwich, you just don't eat it, right? It yeah. doesn't matter. And that's your opinion. But then it became, everyone was able to broadcast their opinion. Yeah. And then it created this value to people's opinion. And there really isn't value. Like nobody cares what your opinion is. That's it's because it's yours. You can feel any way you yeah. want to feel. Yeah. You can feel one way today and wake up and feel different tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That's yours. You can do anything you want. But now that everyone places so much value on these opinions, it becomes your identity. Yeah. And when that happens, I think it becomes so dangerous because we see it all the time in politics where, okay, maybe some dummy texted or tweeted something years ago that, okay, it didn't age well. I'm not talking about anything really bad. I'm just talking about times have changed. Yes. But the problem is no one has awareness or understanding of that. It's like it's set in stone. Yeah. And and now it's just like, well, that's, that's who that person is. And they've never evolved because how could anyone evolve? And then, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. And it's it's crazy. It it is crazy. And that, and it's, I'm glad you brought that up about the things that people wrote years ago when they were dumb and foolish or just not experienced in the world or whatever. And, you know, the three of us, we have sort of as people like to say, we're, we're immigrants to this techno technological world, this social media, our kids, my kids are natives. This is how all they've ever known. Right. So right. they, but that makes it even a little bit more dangerous. Cause I've had to say to them, if you post something, consider it read by your grandmothers, <laughs> your, all your friends, moms, and picture it on the front page of the New York times, whatever you want to do, but think, three, four, five times before you hit send or post. I mean, it's just that it's just that dangerous. And that's unfortunate. And I think that's too not to veer too off far off the path here. But that's what scares people about AI. Because Mm -hmm. now can you can someone take this interview that we're doing and put words in your mouth or put words in my mouth and make it look completely real. And that's that's also terrifying. You're right. I mean, that is a very real concern. I mean, yeah. even the writer strike happening now in Hollywood. I mean, that's one of the things. Obviously, there's a lot more things they're talking about, but that concern around AI. Um, and I was just reading something the other day without going too far into it about, you know, directors being so upset because, you know, they made a movie 20, 30 years ago, or maybe they didn't even, the movie never came out, but the studio owns all those things. And then yeah. they're putting those likenesses in current movies or doing things, and the director has no control over it. Uh, and so it's just, you know, there's so many different things that society is getting weirder and harder to navigate. And if you don't have a backbone, uh, it's it's uh, it's almost impossible you're, because you can't chase the wind, you know, and, and, so and wherever right. it's blowing is very challenging to be. Able. It's you're so right about that. You can't chase the wind. I like that. I'm going to mm-hmm. tell that to my kids later. Trademarked, um, trademarked. I want no, to go. Yeah. <laughs> <But laughs> you right. <laughs> it's absolutely true. You, you've got, you've got to have a backbone. You have to, but that comes with really knowing who you are um, and understanding your values and being really wedded to your values. Yeah. And so it, so it, it's this, there's no app for this folk. Maybe there would be, maybe I'll develop an app, <laughs> well, but that's there's what a we way need to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Take some time and figure out what you value most in the world. 
And then every decision you make and every word that comes out of your mouth should align with those values. So if you value your family, you better damn well act like it. And if you value your, whether it's your faith, your country, your education, your health, whatever it is, do things in alignment with those values. And you will find yourself very well rooted into firm ground. And out of that comes the spine. Man, impossible to have said it better. Um, so look, I Michelle, bet you could have. I, I well, I'm going to try to. I'm going to try yeah. to see if I can trump Michelle Tafoya's <laughs> take on this. <laughs> no, but listen, we could legitimately talk all night. You you are time constrained far more than we are. Uh, so I do want to be conscious of 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 time. Uh, you know, if if we need to wrap things up, we we can certainly do that because I know you know you you have obligations that uh, that we don't have. So well, I could. I I have thoroughly enjoyed this and I'm so glad I said yes. And why don't we do this? Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> well, okay. Next week, I think we're locked in. Michelle Time DeFoya stamp coming that. Back. She said it. She said it. So. We're still recording, right? I just, I yeah. just, <laughs> no, Before, I'd love to do it again. You guys are a blast. Oh awesome. Awesome. Well, we did want to plug, yeah, of course, your, your podcast, which is yes. fantastic. Uh, check your Twitter out. But then you're also, you narrated uh, Triangle Park. Yes. Yep. Can you talk just briefly about that? Because sure. I think this is just going to be It sounds be really cool. Awesome. It's, there's a guy named Alan Farst, and he is an award-winning filmmaker. And I got connected with him. He did a film um, about the, the keyboardist for the Rolling Stones, which won an, uh, several awards. And so I, I saw his work, and he said, I'm doing this film about the first ever NFL game. And here I am having covered the NFL for decades, and I didn't know about this story. Mm -hmm. And it, so this whole documentary covers this first game, how the teams were formed, um, and how this really was the genesis, the very beginning of the National Football League. And we recruited a number of good friends of mine to take part. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald, Tony Dungy, <laughs> Joe Theismann, Joe Buck, <laughs> Troy Aikman, um, Sean McVay, Cooper Cup, a uh, bunch of people to yeah. sit down and and Susie Colbert and help tell this story of the first game, uh, the first NFL game. So it's called Triangle Park. That's the name of the park in Dayton, Ohio, where the game was played. And it's coming out on November 1st. And then starting on Thanksgiving, you can get it on Amazon Prime. So hopefully you'll love it and enjoy it as much as we have enjoyed making it and putting it together. Well, good Lord, you put together a murderer's row of people to be on this thing. <laughs> yeah. So, I Chris mean, Collins it's gonna yeah, it's going to be, it's really, it's yeah. terrific. Yeah. Eric Dickerson. I don't know if I mentioned him. Golly. Just a few Damn. Hall of Famers in there. Yeah. Just, I mean, One or two. listen. We don't do ben a Robinson. lot of name dropping. We don't do a lot of name dropping on the show, but when Michelle Tafoya comes on, she can name drop all she wants. And those are really relevant names because yeah. I mean, the, I think the film is going to be really, really cool. And, I think it is too. I and, know. Yeah, it is. I mean, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're more familiar with it than we are, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, there's no doubt it, it will be super cool. And I know people are going to be looking uh, forward to that. Yep. We want to talk Michelle Tafoya podcast. Obviously I'm, I know that everyone's already checked it out. Universally loved. Oh gosh! Uh, but if anyone hasn't checked it out, make sure you do. Don't be a dummy. Uh, <laughs> and then it's it's also Michelle underscore Tafoya on X or Twitter. Is that correct? Yes. And Michelle with one L. Thank so, you for that. Yes. Believe me, that's easy to. You know, you think I'm Tad, right? It's it's just three letters. I get called everything other than that all the time. No one ever gets it right. It's Ted, Todd, everything else. So do you, Michelle do, with do one people L. People spell it T H A D too. I've gotten that. Yes, I've gotten everything. Two D's as well. Oh. Uh, you know, people just invent things when there's only three letters. They have to find <laughs> creative ways to screw it up. So I feel you. I yeah. do. <laughs> Listen, Michelle, this was an absolute blast. Uh, yes. we can literally not thank you enough. Uh, we could do another episode of us only thanking you. Let's do it again. You guys are so fun. I thank you for the time. It was just, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much, awesome. Michelle. We really thank appreciate it. We can't wait yeah. to have you on in the future, but for, for now, this was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks guys. So, so much. Thank you. Thanks.